Our guest today is Marine Amu. She is a global talent expert currently located in Switzerland. So good evening, Marine. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, Kristen. And I know that you really have focused a lot of your career on that small to mid-sized businesses and startups to help them connect the dots between how do you get exceptional people to implement ambitious ideas to drive business growth? It has been a wild ride the past couple of years with talent across the globe. I don't know if anyone's been immune. So I'm excited about our topic today. And I don't know if there's been a better time to lean in and double down on our greatest asset. And that is human capital. Absolutely. Let's get it kicked off. Given your work with small to mid-sized businesses, where are you seeing companies really focus their efforts this year? Where are they doubling down? Well, I think um, so, so most of the SMBs that, that I talk to are, are based in Europe. And from what I see is that there are different stages where they're at, right? So I think the first thing, and it's still happening right now, is to, to digitalize the, the employee experience. By that, we're talking about you know the ATS, so applicant tracking system for those recruiting you know, enough to justify an ATS system, but also more importantly, like an HCM software. So a human capital management software that enables your team or yourself, if it's a relatively small team and you do not have an HR person um, to really not focus on the admin portion of HR, but really focus on what matters the most and what brings most value to your company, which is your, your people, your team. Um, so, so I think that throughout all the conversations that I've had, um, I'm writing currently a white paper on uh, trends for for um, HR trends for SMEs in, in in Europe. And throughout all the conversations that I've had, it was either implementing a tool or changing the tool that they had, or you know developing further the tool they had implemented. But it was sort of like all the conversations that I've had were very clear. Without that tool we cannot achieve what we want to achieve is to retain and engage with employees, right? And I think you're talking about, and, and I was quite surprised in a way, if, even if you have 20 FTEs, it does make sense to, to invest into such tools. And you have uh, such a large range of tools that really it's not a budget question anymore, right? The investment per employee per month is really relatively small. And, and what these tools enable you to do is really to, remove the, the logistically administrative portion of HR. So you're able to lead like performance management through the tool, you, you, you're able to have checklists for your onboarding and so forth. So it sort of makes the experience for the candidate and then employee much better at your company. And I think at the end of the day, when, when you're talking to a CEO, an owner or, or an investor, they're very aware of their capital, their human capital is key, right? Except you know, it can be a theoretical priority or it can be a very, you know, hands-on priority. And it's about time to digitize that process so we can actually better know how our employees are feeling, what kind of skill set we have within the company, what kind of skill gap we have to fill out in the future and so forth. So I think these tools really enable you to, yeah, to 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 move the HR portion from a cost center to really like strategic value. Um, and, and I think that's where most of the conversations I've had were leaning towards. I know that there's a lot of discussions around AI and so forth, but strangely enough, the, the, the business owners or the, you know, the, the leaders that, that I've met through my conversations, they were just like, yeah, first we need to do that. that that's going to help us very, very quick, relatively quickly also um, to get better at interacting with our employees and making sure that they stay with us. Because one thing for sure is that it's a lot more expensive to lose someone and having to replace that person than retain, train, and grow an employee that's already been with you for a while. Yeah, and we've been seeing that a lot. We used to say HRIS systems, technology, and that was a couple hundred thousand dollars to implement. Now we're looking at a couple hundred dollars to implement. Exactly system. And you mentioned starting at the SMBs are starting at 20 FTE to take that administrative function and digitize it. 
Absolutely. And, and to be very honest, it's, it also depends what kind of growth plan you have, right. As a leader, if you're, if you're planning to grow from 20 to 30 or 40 and, and 50, then, you know, it's very important. If you, on the other hand, saying no, 20 is the top max that we're going to be like, it also depends on, on your company. But again, I think that the first step is to look at what is your employee experience with you? right how 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 are the interactions how do you where do you keep the documents i mean this is also a very european perspective but obviously with gdpr and all the regulations around privacy and uh, private data and so forth it's something that even the smallest smes have to take care of now and and it's not possible to just ignore it so so i think it, it sort of makes the entire process a lot leaner um, and as you said, like before, it used to be hundred thousand dollars to implement a very basic HRIS, and now it's it can be five or six dollars per employee per month. So you know, it's these are costs that can can be integrated again if your focus shifts from like theoretically thinking about human capital to like very hands on practically. How do we live by our sayings, right? How do we ensure that we actually uh, put our employees at the center of what we do? And you mentioned it going from an administrative to really a strategic value driver. We've seen that shift of HR needs a system, excel on steroids to track everything to how do we engage all of the leadership in the company and give them a tool to actually drive performance and actually engage with their employees. Yeah, I, I think that's that's another very important point, right? And and it all also varies depending on the size. I mean, how many FTEs you have. Obviously, when you're 20 people, it's like it's almost like a family. Everybody know each other, they know each other's birthday. I mean, we can hope that at 20 people, right? The moment you grow like to a hundred FTE, it's a very different story, right? So 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 I think that's 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 a very important point to sort of say, like, how well will you know? Uh, what people are capable of doing or where the skills are missing. And I think that's, for me, the biggest concern when you lead an organization is to know, like, w of course, the well-being, like the, the the overall happiness of your employees at work. Even I think happiness is not necessarily the right word, but, you know, how, how engaged they are with your company and their role. Um, and and the, 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 this, the second aspect is obviously to know if you're growing, if you're developing your company, do you have the right skill sets currently? Where are the gaps? And how do you fill these gaps? And I think, you know, it, it, this, this performance management is extremely key. It's all about you developing your business. Are you going to be able to do it with the team you have? Can you train the team you have to upskill or not? And if you cannot, then what kind of profiles do you need to add on to that team in order to achieve your objectives? And I think this, again, if you have the right tool, it really makes it easier for you to have like these strategic conversations with your board or with the rest of the management team. Because the worst that I've heard, and I've heard it a lot, is sort of like, you know, the CEO of an organization that says, yeah, yeah, I know exactly, you know, the skill sets that I have. And you ask one simple questions around marketing. Marketing is a discipline that evolves every month almost, right? And it's sort of like, if somebody has a marketing degree from 15 years ago, it doesn't mean that their marketing knowledge is relevant for today. And the same applies to a lot of skill set. So I think it's also important to integrate into the tools like ways of having a diversified opinion on what the skills, what the, the skills that you actually have within your company. And that's also, you know, speaking to, to an amazing HR leader that I've interviewed for my white paper. Um, she she was giving very concrete example of of how she was tracking that to make sure that she had the right skill set to be able to achieve the, you know the strategic objectives of the company and um, typically also one thing that she implemented and very gracefully was um, <laughs> tests as part of the you know performance review to sort of say for technical roles. Uh, do they still have the right skill sets to be able to to do the job or what's missing for them to be able to to fulfill the the, the position to, to the best of their abilities so that you know that way you you have a more objective view of mm -hmm. the skill sets that you have 
and you're able to establish the skills gap, the skills gap that you, you know, you need to fill out in order to, um, to, you know, continue in the future. And I think that's, that's a bigger, bigger conversation, right? And, and again, like if you're a 20 FTE organization, it's a different conversation to have than if you're 700, very clearly. But I think having that top of mind is, is probably something that leaders of any size of organization should have. Do I have the, the right people? Uh, what's missing for them to be where we want to be in five years? And can help? Can, can the organization help them get there? And even uh, we talk about that, that 20 FTE mark, even going from 15 FTE to 25 FTE, it's not 10 more, it's exponentially more because as they grow, it compounds and you keep, you've mentioned skill sets and gaps so much. And I think this is really one of the top topics of conversations that we're having with companies is there's that good old fashioned job description. Do we have the right people doing the right things? That good old fashioned job description. And you are continually giving some great examples on what needs to be done. What are the skill sets to do them? Where are the gaps? What are you seeing as, as businesses are trying to figure out who do we need moving forward? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a it's a conversation that I have also a lot, right? To sort of, oh, this is your theoretical job description, but really what what is the role about? Um, and and there's a gap here, like like very, very straightforward. There is a gap. First of all, um, I always tell my clients, like, unicorns do not exist. Maybe we can find a pink zebra, but you know, like let's 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 be realistic about things. That's the, that's the first thing. And then there's also when you double click in a job description, very often time, you, you, you know, it's not clear, is this person accountable for this? Or is this person actually doing the job? Or, you know, and, and through that, you, you potentially miss out on great candidates, right? Because it's not clear in, in, in the job description. So I think the same way you're going to look at skills and skill gaps, you have to look at your job description and challenge yourself. Do I have the right job description for every role in my organization? Or sometimes there's not even a job description, which <laughs> raises a, a, another set of questions, right? Um, but but I think it is sort of definitely something to to look into when you're looking at you. Anyways, you can't do really a skill gap analysis if you don't have clarity on the roles uh, that are required to to achieve your objectives. Um, so for me, it's, but again, like if you have the right tool, these are relatively easy to manage. Um, and, but the thinking behind it, right? And that's the role of a leader. It's not necessarily just the role of the person responsible of HR, right? It's, the, it's the, really the role of a leader to establish like, hey, who do we need and, and what skills do we need now in the future and make sure that it's communicatable, that people can actually understand what you, what you're dreaming of. <laughs> <laughs> either put you back in reality um, or, or simply, you know, have maybe in-house people who identify to this role and could grow into that function. And I love that you're pointing out it's a future, it's becoming more and more of a future looking conversation versus what are the skills we need today and what tasks need to be accomplished today. Job descriptions are no longer a task list. They are what's the future state, what needs to be accomplished and how are we going to go about accomplishing that within our organization, which is the question that's coming up a lot in these discussions. And we'd ask you about how much are businesses leaning into culture fit right now? Because there's always been, there's the skills, what can I train? What can, what do I need them to bring? And how important is it for them to fit in and get our culture? Um, I think, it, strangely enough, so the, the culture discussion always comes somehow in the discussion, right? Uh, it has very different degrees of what culture means. And, you know, I've, I've heard pretty much everything on the description of culture. Um, and, and obviously, companies live it very differently, right? Some are very theoretical, something written on the wall, and then there's a completely different set of behaviors. Um, and I think when you're recruiting and you want a culture fit this is the time to really 
look like very honestly into how how your company operates from a people and process perspective. Um, and and typically, oftentimes, we focus on the people side and not necessarily look into the process part of it. Um, and I think that one of the one of the questions that I I always ask to understand you know uh, the culture is a simple question: How are decisions made in your company? And then you'll have like a set of like, so basically we discuss like, you know, so, oh, it's very interactive. It's a common decision. Yeah. But at the end, it's the CEO that decides. Ah, okay. So, so this is a sort of democratic process, but there's one person that decides at the end. And that's very telling, right? Because you might have a culture described as very collaborative, very uh, open and so forth. But in the decision-making process, People can discuss, but it's one person that's going to make the final decision. And so there's a there's a gap between how we talk about culture as a company and how we really operate within the company. And I think it's also a very important question for candidates, right? I'm, I'm always waiting for them to ask questions about culture because it means that then they're really interested on what it is to work, what, what it is like to work for this company. And, and I think through that simple example, it's very interesting for somebody who wants to recruit to, to join their team, to, to understand and to be able to talk about it openly. And for candidates who are potentially applying for roles to have this, this question around, hey, but how, how decisions made from this company? What's the process to make a big decision? Um, and see if this is a fit as how they want to work. And very recently I was, um, I was uh, recruiting a CFO for, for a large SME. And again, through different interactions with, with the, the management team, and you know, I sort of understood how they work. And the, the, the candidate that sort of stood out uh, from the other candidates had spontaneously talked about his previous role, saying, yeah, so this was really like, you had to be in the office because everything was shared like right this moment and decisions were met like in the moment, and it was this fast paced environment. And I was just like, yeah, he's gonna feel right at home in the new organization. And that was super important for me, regardless of how friendly or how, you know, th that was for me irrelevant at this point, because I just wanted to make sure that the person had previous experience working in an environment that operated very similarly to what he had um, lived before. I, and you talked in there about how companies are leveraging this to attract talent. There's a lot of discussion around this as to, and each, it seems every couple of years, okay, how are we, especially SMBs trying to compete with larger organizations, with large salaries and budgets and, and comp plans and campuses with, with game boards. Um, what are you seeing or how are you advising the small to mid-sized businesses this, this year on how can you win that game? and get the people that you want. Yeah, I think this is not a conversation that's going to go away for SMBs, right? It's it's you cannot compete on salaries, on benefits, on, you know, also in a way career development, right? Because you don't have a global organization where you can say, "Hey, you were a CFO in the US, now you're going to be a CFO in Mexico for the next 6 months," right? It, it's it's not that type of career opportunities. So I think the 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 things that First of all, the things that don't cost money at all that SMB can implement tomorrow and that are highly valued by, by, can, by candidates and then employees is transparency. I think being a transparent leader, um, it does not require investment at all, right? Um, mm -hmm. But it's this effort that you put into being transparent of where the business is going, what's the strategy, involve you know, employees in, a, in SMB can really, really make a difference. Having empowered, um, safe, you know, the feeling of safety and accountable is oftentimes something that you will not necessarily get in a bigger structure that might be political, that might be, you know. So I think that that's, that's something that definitely SMBs do and do well in certain cases. Um, I've had examples where an entire organization, uh, sort of, it's a large company, 700 FTE. And they sort of, the way they look at training and skill development of their employees is they take the business objectives of the company for the next year 
and they design specific courses to make sure that all employees are up to that level. And I think this is amazing because basically, regardless if you're a carpenter or if you're a CFO, you sort of know exactly where the company is going and the company is empowering you to get there, right? So there's this feeling of, of belonging, but also like, hey, I contribute directly to this company. So, so that's, that's something, of course, building an entire program of courses and, and education, this, this costs money. But the transparency around where you want to go and where the business is going, that's something that doesn't cost anything. Um, I think also um, an, another thing that doesn't cost any money is to lead by example. And in a small organization, you're even more, you know, like employees will, will see. So, so another example, if you're, you know, if you're asking your employees to be careful of budgets all the time, no, you cannot have a second screen or no, you know. And yourself and the management team, you go on a beautiful retreat for three days in a five-star hotel. That's these are conflicting messages, right, for employees. And I think it's it's very important, like as a leader, these are the two things that you can do immediately that sort of differentiate yourself from um from from a much larger company that might offer better perks and benefits, but will not, you know, do these two things that are important for 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 employees. I think also. In a way, if you are an SMB, like what you offer is very unique. And, and I think that for candidates who are thinking of applying to an SMB, and it's also what attracts them is the size, the reasonable size, the, the sort of the interactions and the empowerment that they can get. I think it's also something that you can play on, right? Um, and apart from that, I, I also think that very, very concretely as, as an owner or as a leader, you can work on your employee branding. It's not about doing like 50K corporate video about who you are. It's about, hey, like how about we communicate on LinkedIn on how our employees are, what kind of roles they're doing, what kind of you know things they achieve on a daily basis. And I think these are things where you need to think about allocating resources to that, but it's not as gigantic of a task as you might think. Right, that's where we've seen that big shift with, you talk about marketing 15 years ago, marketing nowadays, it's almost, you're leaning more into marketing towards candidates and employee branding almost as much as the external brand. I, and I think also, sorry to interrupt, Kristen, I think the market has also shifted, right? I think before there was sort of like, we are the employer. We select who we want in our company. And today it's it's an open market, right? So candidates are saying like, yeah, but you know, you do this and this company does that. And then company X, Y, Z do something different. They shop around. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, the, the rarer the talents, the more they're going to shop around. And so your value proposition to them is very key. And the value proposition is, yeah, where your company is going, what is the role, but also all those little things we talked about, transparency, leading by ex example. Um, and, and, and I think that they, they do the, the great talents, the one who have choices, many options, they will double click on a lot of those topics. And I think as an SMB, it's not a huge investment for you to say, hey, how can I be attractive to my 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 target group of of candidates and employees it's just a matter of prioritizing that maybe more than you used to do in the past how oh, when you look at what those candidates are valuing so i've ceo friend of mine figured out he's got he's very lucky he's a very tech tech heavy group of individuals small company not a lot of budget, not a lot of options, but said, look, $300 every year, every employee, you don't have to put a receipt, you don't have to do anything, here's the money, chair, mouse, screen, whatever you need, you can spend it in any, you wanna take a coworker to lunch, you spend it any way you want. They're very empowered to do that, but that's, he knew that they would value that. How would you, what would be your suggestions to figure out how do I, without asking, so what do you value? What do you want? Give me your list of five, or is it as simple as an interview? How are you figuring out those people that you want in your organization and keep 
what are they valuing and how do we do it in a way that we can't afford to and fits within our culture? Yeah, I think I have some interesting examples of, of things that have been implemented, right, in, in companies of relatively small size. So one thing that always works is you don't have to work on your birthday. This is just a small thing, right? But it's sort of if it happens during a weekday, you get a free day off. And that's something where, you know, you can you, you can make something out of it. You can do like birthday vouchers to distribute to your employee, uh, or you can just have that as part of your employee handbook, right? But but these are things that, again, cost the company money, but not a lot of money. And yet it's a nice perk to have. Um, I think in terms of the, the example of the 300 you know, dollar that you can spend on anything. Um, this is also something where it's a, it's a nice touch, right? And and it's something where where employees we see that that's cool that that the company is, you know, acknowledging that I might want to take my coworker to lunch, and I have a small budget for that, and it's not a lot, right? One of the the thing that I I also that that always impressed me is that for the Oberoi hotels, um, which is a chain of luxury hotels, every single employee from the doorman until the the general manager have up to twenty dollars, whatever can make their customers happy. If it's about buying a mango on the market because you know it's mango season, or you know, and, and I think it's these are the little things that can amount to a certain amount of money. But in terms of the impact that they have on how engaged employees will be with the company, is 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 no common comparison with uh, with other programs. So I think if you look at yourself as a business owner or a CEO, it's really about hey, how could how can you make that employee journey a little bit extra, right? And oftentimes it's not going to cost you millions. I love that you just took it out and said, how can we be part of their journey? Rather, they are part of our journey in growing the company. And I, with that, um, I just want to make sure we hit on one of the biggest topics that we're seeing, especially as companies are going from one generation to the next, uh, obviously entrepreneur and, ba and baby boomers are aging out, that concept of succession planning. What in transparency and looking forward, what's going to happen next? And what is that employee's journey with our company? And what's the company's plan? What are you seeing yeah. those SMBs do? So I think this is a universal topic, right? I think that the, the sort of succession issues are as prominent in Europe as they are in North America and include Canada as well. Um, you have Japan, Korea that are also facing uh, huge succession issues. And there's two things, right? If it's an owner-led organization, it's one type of succession planning. And I think if, if it's already a management team, then it's, you know, obviously it's also a topic of conversation, but it's different. And what's fundamentally different is the emotional component of succession planning. If you're talking to a business owner, someone who started a company 20, 30 years ago, They've spent, they poured their life into this company. It's everything to them. It's their identity. So having a conversation around, hey, you should start thinking about what, what's going to happen when you retire. They don't want to hear about their retirement. It's a topic they do not want to hear, right? Because it, it, it questions not only the practical aspect of handing over your company or finding a successor within your company, but it's also like what? what will my identity as a person be when I'm not the CEO or the owner of the company anymore? And I think that, you know, for, for that, for the, for the owners um, looking at succession planning, it's a conversation, the earlier you start, the better, because it's going to be a long emotional journey to get to the point where, you know, either, you know, it's someone in your family that's going to take over, or you're going to have to sell because there's no one in your family that can take over or, you know, like before you get there, you need to start the process of your identity in this company, right? And I think that that's from what I've seen, it's it's difficult. And oftentimes you cannot even openly talk about it because you don't want your competitors to know. You don't want, you know, you don't want your team to know. Um, so so who do you talk to? And in in, uh, in Europe, 
there, there are a lot of advisors uh, that specialize in starting these conversations very discreetly. So what are the options? And one of the most common thing that sparked this discussion and then this reflection is to mean an owner that has sold their business or gone through that succession planning and handover of their business and removing themselves from operations. Um, how many times you have the conversation with a business owner that says, yeah, I cannot retire, but, and you double click, double click, and why, why, why? And it's like, I cannot stay at home all day with my wife. And this is something, you know, like you can address this if you know about it. But again, to be able to have that conversation, you need to have a level of trust that, you know, maybe they don't want to have with their employees or even with their management team. Um, I think when it comes to succession planning in companies that are not owner-led, um, this is something where typically I've seen great examples of, again, taking it as early as possible, identifying talents, and don't put your eggs, all your eggs in the same basket. So you need to have several potential uh, candidates to take over the role and to sort of see, again, where is the gap? What do they need to get to the CFO, the CEO position in, in the company? And how do you help them get there? Um, there's a there's a there's a great example of of um, of a CEO of a company who's uh, you know who sees himself for another five years at the realm of this company, and he already hired someone very young, and he's going to spend the next five years mentoring that person up to the point where this person will be able able to take over the CEO position. And I think to have that level of integrity as a CEO, it's rare. It's rare, but it's very important because then you ensure the legacy of your business. You ensure the legacy of what you've built in the past, you know, 30 years and you ensure that it lives on. So I think, you know, again, and it's, it's quite transparent the way he's doing it. So the person is, is integrated into a managerial role and will slowly grow. And he's sort of like open that this person is, you know, the, the future CEO and he's being mentored into the role across the next five years. That transparency is really setting an example for everyone else because we all have employees who started with the company, they've been in that role for five years and they can't imagine giving up that role and taking on other responsibilities and they get overwhelmed. So we are seeing those discussions be more transparent. I just met someone recently and asked, so what's your plan? And she said, she gave me the date that is four and a half years from now to the date. Said, I've got someone in my company who is going to buy me out. She will be taking over. We have it planned. And this date is all over our computer, all over our walls. And we're constantly thinking of it. So I appreciate those examples as we're seeing these conversations become uh, come to the forefront. I know that we are, we're up on time here. I, Mary, I know that you and I could probably go on for hours. So what we'll do is shift the conversation to LinkedIn. I've seen a lot of heads nodding and there's so much experience of individuals on this call or personal experiences from owners and CEOs. We'd love to have you share uh, with us on LinkedIn uh, post. And Mary, thank you so much. I know it's late there. I appreciate you joining us and just sharing your global insights um, of what you're seeing so we can maybe look a little beyond our world here in the U.S. or North America and say what what's being done globally because it's all interconnected. Thank you so much for inviting me, Kristen, and uh, I hope it was a useful session for all of you. Thank you for joining, for being here early morning, your time. Uh, uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation on LinkedIn. Fantastic. So thank you for being with us here on Serious Leadership, and we'll see you next Tuesday.